Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world of ours. I hope you're safe and sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And welcome to Carnegie Connects, a series of conversations about issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Following Hamas's savage terror attack against Israel on October 7th, an attack that claimed more Jewish lives than in any single day since the Nazi Holocaust, and Israel's punishing blockade and bombing of Gaza, perhaps a prelude to a major ground campaign. I fear we've entered a long tunnel that may claim more innocent lives on both sides before we emerge. Still today, I can think of no one better to shed much needed light on the complexity of the crisis now unfolding than former Prime Minister Ehud Barak. He needs no introduction, uh, but he clearly deserves one. Ehud Barak was the 10th Prime Minister of the State of Israel, served 1999 to 2001, the most decorated soldier in the history of the State of Israel. Prime Minister led far-reaching efforts to negotiate peace agreements, first with Syria and later with the Palestinian Authority with the active participation of Bill Clinton. Regrettably, these negotiations, which I participated as well, did not result in the breakthrough necessary to conclude final agreements. Before being elected prime minister, uh, Ehud Barak completed an illustrious 36 year career, ending at the top as the chief of the general staff of the Israeli Defense Forces. Mr. Barak received his BS in mathematics and physics from Hebrew University in Jerusalem and his MS in economic engineering systems at Stanford, in California. Mr. Prime Minister, I want to welcome you to Carnegie Connects. You've been on the program before. Uh, we benefited greatly from your wisdom, more important from your clarity and your honesty. And we need that now because I think um, we confront a truly extraordinary a uh, horrific moment um, in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I wonder if I could start with a few general questions. You're, you're, you're in Israel, you, you were in New York, but you returned recently. If someone asked you to describe the mood of the country as you see it, to the extent you can generalize for an entire nation, what are the elements that now comprise that mood? Um, uh, probably the first uh, 24 hours or, or so, uh, all, all over Saturday, it was a grave shock. No one predicted, not just uh, ordinary citizens in their homes all around the country, not only the citizens of this uh, vicinity of uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, even the leaders of the um, armed forces, intelligence, or, or the political uh, level, no one predicted such an event. And there was a shock. Um, probably after some 36 uh, hours and uh, until uh, probably a day ago, it, was, it turned into a kind of very painful mourning and, and sense of deep grief. People start to uh, learn, the whole public start to learn about the dimensions of the whole issue about the destruction, what happened. And uh, stories of both heroism of, uh, of a few individuals, sometimes uh, volunteers to, to uh, protect their own village or kibbutz or some other settlement uh, without even a rifle, like the AR-15, you know, it's in Israel. You know, the, most, of the, most of them had was just handguns and they came against uh, dozens of, uh, of um, terrorists at each, each place uh, heavily equipped, uh, but also the helplessness and, and the pictures that reminded everyone with a, a good memory. There are few that are old enough to remember it uh, personally, but the picture and the story is about the, the Holocaust, uh, not, not about Israel. We, we established the state in order to avoid such uh, appearances or um, occasion from happening. Uh, so it was 
painful. The amount of people involved make it in a small Israel um, case where everyone in the country knows uh, some people who lost their uh, dearest ones. And so it was a kind of deep grief. In the last 24 hours, it turned into sober understanding that we are at war. A situation is stabilized on the, on the very front uh, around the Gaza Strip. But three elements make uh, people more calm. Uh, we mobilized 350,000 reservists uh, who are deployed all over the area, both in the north and around the Gaza Strip. Uh, there is, uh, in the last hour, a uh, the uh, emergency uh, government where uh, two leaders of the opposition, uh, uh, Gantz and um, Eisenkot, both of them uh, were uh, within the series of my successor at, as commander of the commanders of the armed forces. And together with three of the party, uh, their party members, uh, they joined the government. And uh, uh, Gantz and Eisenkot, together with uh, Netanyahu, um, uh, Gallant, the Minister of Defense, and, and uh, uh, Dermer, whom you know from the embassy here, they will establish the inner cabinet. So it added a lot of gravitas and a lot of uh, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know how to call it, uh, relaxation for the worries because both Gantz and Eisenkot, uh, together with Gallant, are known to be uh, severe, uh, uh, sober senior generals with deep understanding of war and, and, and all its aspects, and people become more, a little bit more quiet. And the third element is the unexpected uh, lengths towards the uh, President uh, Biden administration went to support Israel, to show the support, to to deploy it physically, uh, the, the Gerald Ford the aircraft carrier heading with uh, several other vessels uh, to the eastern part of the of the Mediterranean. And once again, I don't see them having to take off from the, the deck of the aircraft carrier. Yeah. But it's surprising to hear how much confidence it injected into the, the mood in the Israeli street. So the deployment, is that the largest deployment uh, mobilization in the history of the country? No, no, it's not yet full deployment, probably include uh, more than, more than half, a, half a million. Uh, it's not yet there, but it's enough forces to make sure that uh, such event or something similar to it cannot surprise us uh, from the Hezbollah in the north. And if there is a need to uh, decision and then... And, uh, need to execute it, to enter, to invade the Gaza Strip, take a part of it or all of it, uh, there are enough forces deployed to, to execute it. You know, one Israeli with whom I spoke, whom we both know, um, mentioned that it wasn't just the fear, you referred to it, it was the fear combined with the helplessness. Can you, yeah. can you elaborate a little more on that? Helpless because the government was unprepared, helpless because the government couldn't respond in time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the attack was planned quite uh, skillfully, planned, hidden along the last uh, stages of uh, preparation and executed in quiet, uh, quiet capabilities that we did not kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, believe uh, the, the Hamas uh, already uh, has. But uh, basically, one of the first uh, targets were the, uh, the information sources, the cameras uh, over the barrier. They were uh, blinded by, deliberately by quite sophisticated uh, kind of uh, technique using uh, small drones, drones, small drones yeah. uh, commercial drones. Uh, then they immediately took over the central command post of the whole Gaza Strip area, which is very close to the, uh, to the barrier, and took over by surprise the, the forces there and so on. And as a result of it, uh, there was no central command. Even the, the guys who usually have to ask attack helicopters to come from some bases of, of the Air Force, which are probably 15 minutes or 20 minutes of flight from the place, uh, the the uh, demand to send them didn't come. It took several hours, painful hours, 
And the whole, you know, the, the perception among the people over there was desperate. It's, it's sent shivers through your spine to listen to the, the pieces of talk from that. Come to save us, come to save us. They are shooting. We hear them. They enter, they penetrate the, um, there is a better uh, protected uh, heavy concrete uh, Uh, room in any modern uh, apartment in Israel uh, to protect against the direct heat of uh, uh, rockets if they're not too big. Uh, but uh, and people can lock it, but you can open it from without. So there was a desperate event. Sometimes they took some set fire, the whole building and people were, um, I don't know how to cut it, uh, say it in English, they got uh, with no, no, Uh, no oxygen they were suffocated suffocated and uh and people you know they 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 murder it was a murderous a barbarian attack uh, there is one soldier was beheaded uh, some uh, pregnant woman were uh, hit on the on the uh, stomach uh, they they killed whole families in their room hugging each other they dragged some uh, some uh, victims with them it's uh it's a uh, it's quite a shock most of the people never been in the battlefield never smelled the the uh, unique smell of a uh, burnt human flesh and mm-hmm. it was uh, quite a shock and uh, that's what make it so so critical because the it's not just failure of the intelligence at the operational level and, and uh, political level uh, Uh, preparation or, or direction it it touches the primary role of the government vis-a-vis its citizens yes. this is before before pursuit of happiness there is the uh, commitment of government to protect the life of its citizens and when when they are over there isolated alone couldn't do anything for hours they don't see the Israeli Uh, famous defense force coming to to help them it was a uh, shattering that that contract between the governed and those who govern really is the essence of the legitimacy of the contract that a government undertakes with its people and I I, I understand that before we move on to what's coming I wanted to ask you two questions um you How, how would you summarize the intelligence failure as well as the operational failure? This has been compared to 73, but is it, is it the same sort of comparison, the conception, uh, the conception that Israelis had of their adversaries? How, how do you explain this? I mean, this is the Middle East's most preeminent military power. With incredible intelligence organizations and capacity how do you explain it first of all uh, I'm not sure that I can fully explain it at this stage because uh, any explanation has to to be based on uh, data and details and facts, yes. uh, which I do not uh, we all do not yet fully know so it will be fully clarified only when uh, it's over for sure certain immediate uh, lessons were drawn in immediately by the people here. But uh, basically I think there are similarities with any major um, uh, surprise based on uh, gradually created conceptions in the mind of the defender. It, it, in this regard, it reminds us of uh, 73 and even uh, Roberta Wallstatter and uh, mm. uh, Pearl Harbor. Yes. It's the same story. I'm quite confident that we will look backward, it will be found that there were many, not single, many uh, hints, uh, signs and alerts. And uh, they were not interpreted because of a conception that uh, 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 Hamas, which uh, gets certain kind of spatial kind of uh, more caring attitude than the Palestinian Authority by the Israeli government, doesn't have a reason to to be uh, too active so the preparations were interpreted as a either as, as an exercise or as a, a, a show that has to conflict uh, convince the 
חזבאללה או the Iranians, they are, uh, they are doing something and not uh, lying or, or idly. So it's a part of it, it's basically a concept that uh, misled the, the leaders. It was now published a few hours ago in Israel that in the last hours, around midnight of, uh, of Friday night, right. uh, six hours before uh, this, uh, this event started, there were certain signs of un unusual movement, which led to, to, to kind of tele telco conversation between the head of the secret service, the head of the army, the commander of the, uh, the regional command, but they decided at the end to, to do certain small things, uh, probably something uh, small, small, small kind of uh, volume will happen, uh, but they decided to delay the full clarification of the, what exactly is going on for tomorrow. By tomorrow, it became clear that something right. dramatic happened. So uh, another element is that the Hamas understood well what exactly we know about them and how do we know it. So once you have the, these uh, peeping holes that you, you know where, where you are looked at and what it covers, they can make sure that those areas that are uh, 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 hidden from you, for example, messages run uh, runs over an A4 uh, uh, pieces with handwritten hand, uh, A4 uh, paper pieces uh, on on the motorcycle from uh, end to end of the of the Gaza Strip cannot be followed by the Israelis. Yeah. So over there you can discuss the whole things. You know that we are well over the phone system and probably of some physical communication system, so they use this to derail us to other directions, so on. This kind of, of observation will gather. And the same happened with the, with the uh, military. It's routine. That's the role of routine. You, you are there uh, usually when a new round that comes once a year, once in two years, there is preparation gradual, uh, uh, gra gradually cascading toward the eruption. So you feel it and you raise the readiness. Here, the barrier, both over the surface and under the ground, uh, made people more kind of uh, relaxed. And the needs of uh, more forces in the West Bank as a result of, uh, of the situation there, the terror wave, but also the demand from the extremist right-wingers that are focused on the settlement movements uh, there kind of move the emphasis from even a uh, treatment of any threat to preparation for or preference for the uh, West Bank over the Gaza Strip. And everything that came interpreted as something related to this... Uh, this... Uh, not very dramatic needs. And they prepared it quite, uh, quite successful. We are, it's a major failure of our intelligence, major failure of our intelligence, which mm -hmm. caused, as you mentioned, the most severe blow to Israel since it was established. Yeah. Before we move on to what's coming, I want to ask you a question um, which has intrigued me. Some people would would answer it, would ask why are we even asking this question, but can you explain why? Can you explain the indiscriminate, savage killing of civilians? This was Al-Qaeda. This was the Islamic State. I've heard an explanation that this was not, that there were two waves of attackers, a first wave and a second wave. Can you I mean, maybe it's an unfair question. I mean, what? No, Aaron, Aaron, allowed me to answer. It's a lie. It's a cover story that probably invented along the way. It suddenly uh, came to the minds of the, the leadership of Hamas in Gaza that uh, probably they uh, were too successful. Yes. And that the enthusiasm of uh, kind of a barbarian behavior uh, might uh, uh, backfire that in the even within the Arab world, even with uh, because you you cannot easily uh, explain in terms of uh, Islam uh, this kind this type of Al Qaeda or, or Daesh we call it means ISIS 
like uh, operations and, and executions. <laughs> so they invented, invi invented this story that there was another wave and yeah. the other wave was of uh, civilians. There were many civilians. They came to rob the assets. It's very close. And they uh, just robbed the area, probably got into some conflict. The, organi the organized uh, barbarian uh, murderous attack was planned and prepared. And there was probably 1,500, probably 2,000 people spread over. There are 20 settlements, kibbutzim and moshavim, around the strip, the whole strip, over some 40 miles of line. Uh, 20 of them, uh, one city uh, with some 30,000 people, they wrote another city probably 15 miles deeper into Israel uh, than the Fakim. And that's basically where targets, if we just had a platoon in each one of these 20 and a company in, in each city, the whole thing would have failed. And all these forces together, the 22 forces, would combine no more than three infantry battalions out of 26 that are deployed, yeah. uh, probably 20 of them in, in, the, in the West Bank. So it was misjudgment of the risk as a result of misjudgment of deployment and, and so on. But the whole story is fake. Fake. It's in retrospect trying to correct the uh, justification the Israeli drove for this uh, brutal behavior in uh, in uh, raising the bar uh, to to set the objective on uh, paralyzing any military terrorist capability of the Hamas yeah. to just erase all their capabilities. Let's um let's move on now to the future or not yeah the future or the present. Um, there have been reports. Seems obvious the mobilization that the Israelis are on the verge of a major ground campaign in Gaza. I've heard uh, Israeli politicians and even uh, current serving um, um, ministers talk about changing the reality in Gaza, that this is the objective of the campaign, to change the reality. As you sit there and you and we wait for what seems to be an inevitable campaign, a large campaign, how would you identify the objectives of such a campaign? I don't think that this formulation, even other formulation of the objectives are clear enough. You can hang everything on it and even without doing anything, without the whole event ever Never happening. Yeah. The, the Middle East is continuously changing its uh, landscape. <laughs> that, that's not a real concrete definition. But I, I say the following. If I have to assess, I would tell that it's, uh, nothing, uh, nothing is inevitable. But I would put a probability of 80% uh, probably there, there will be a, a, a ground forces incursion into the Gaza Strip. It can take more than one, one uh, version uh, from uh, take from certain raids to taking part of the the uh, Gaza Strip and namely close around the city, or to take the whole thing, including the city or the city first, and it take, takes different prices or cost in in many aspects and so on. But it's let's say uh, eighty percent. There are probably fifty percent probability that it will uh, stretch into into wider conflict with probably the Hezbollah in Lebanon probably some dormant cells of Hamas or, or Islamic Jihad in the West Bank, or probably some even uh, Shiite militias uh, sponsored by, by Iran on the, on the Syrian side of the Golanites. All, all, all these well, wait, let, well, let, me, let me stop you there for a minute. 50% chance that Israel could end up in a 2006 situation with Hezbollah? Yeah, 50%. Not because I know something that you don't no, know, I get it. Uh, which make it 50. It's because there are two possibilities. Either, either it will happen or won't happen, so <laughs> it's 50%. I, I, so remember, it's, I remember somebody asked you at one point in, in right before Camp David to sum up the situation. And you said, I, I, sum I, it up I in two word, three words. The situation was good or not so good. No, it's a paraphrase on another uh, joke on Yeltsin, I was asked by a guest to, to summarize at the height of the, the 
uh, is coming to power to summarize the situation in one say a uh, one word he said good uh, so the guests uh, wonder in two words say not good <laughs> no but it's it's 50 percent I would say it's it's not a inevitable it's not inevitable but it's a, a high per, high probability of uh, incursion into the Gaza Strip and somewhat lower possibility of this whole uh, stretch but I will right. I will explain it in a moment the difference is so in regard to the operation in Gaza Strip, you know, we can take most, take over most of the uh, uh, Gaza Strip, both south of uh, the city and even the, the small corner northern of the city of Gaza, be within probably two days. And uh, if there is a need to take over the city, which is a heavily built area, as you can see in the, in the pictures, it might take, I don't know, a week or 10 days. If you want them to clean the city from every uh, hand grenade or explosive uh, IED or, or, or uh, shoulder-held uh, anti-tank uh, weapon, uh, it might take several weeks. It can take uh, three weeks or six weeks. But all in all, within uh, two months, Israel could be in a full control of the Gaza Strip. There are still uh, problems uh, that I will mention in a moment. So basically, uh, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, even if it spread over the whole area, Israel is strong enough to deal with all of this. We are not under any kind of existential uh, threat, even without the American force. And we highly appreciate its presence in, in our uh, arena. But uh, basically, Israel is not under any existential threat, and we will win. It takes more sweat, more toil, more... more um, uh, um, tears and more blood, but it will end in our victory. Having said that, there are four, four different constraints on the actual planning and balancing of this uh, equation. Uh, uh, constraint number one is the hostages. Yes. It, uh, in the history, we once gave them uh, 1,000 prisoners for one single soldier that, uh, that found himself uh, uh, taken by the Hamas. They have now 150, probably more. Some of them probably a quarter, not even uh, uh, only Israeli citizens. They belong to other, probably American passport, British passport, European passport. Uh, some of them are uh, does not have a Israeli passport, but uh, only Thailand or, or Nepal. So I assume that uh, the Hamas will have interest to get rid of them, to release them. And then, but they still will have uh, probably 100 or pro uh, close to 100 Israelis, men, women, uh, babies, elderly ladies, some of them uh, Holocaust survivors at the age of 85 or, or, or 90. And uh, uh, they will try to get uh, whatever they get for it, uh, namely the release of all the prisoners. It complicates the consideration about the different activities because I don't want to dive into detail. Everyone uses the imagination and can uh, weigh certain ideas how you can create a cost for Israel uh, using these um, uh, hostages as a type of uh, human shield. Uh, yeah. Let's define it this way. So that's one constraint. The other constraint is the one that I mentioned earlier, to whom we can pass the torch. Yes. Well, and once we take the whole Gaza Strip and eliminate it, Hamas, who, who will take over? Ideal situation would be if uh, the Arab world uh, will demand from us, and probably the UN demand of us to withdraw, and an Arab uh, multi, multi force, uh, Arab uh, kind of uh, group led by Egyptian, Emiratis, uh, Moroccan, Saudis. Bahrain, it doesn't matter, will uh, take the role of keep order and avoid uh, re-emerging of, of terror for a limited period, let's say six months, until it will be given to the Palestinian authority. Right. It's uh, ideal, but I'm not sure that it's possible. It will, be, uh, will have to be tested. And I raised this doubt because some 15 years ago, when I was a prime minister, I tried to raise this idea with uh, uh, Amr Sliman, you probably remember him, the head of uh, Secret Services in Egypt, right. then with Mubarak. And when they they rebelled against the very right. raising of the idea, I tried to, I went to, to King uh, Abdullah and asked to meet with uh, Abu Mazen over there. And 
even for him, uh, you couldn't get uh, any, no one wanted to, uh, to be part of a conspiracy arranged by the Israelis, sure. because they were afraid of leaks, and no one would uh, like to come to, to Gaza Strip on, on Jewish, on Israeli bayonets. So it's not simple, but that's another constraint. You have to find someone to put it. And the, the idea that you can, okay, let's delay it. it it's down the stream. We'll first of all, we remember Afghanistan, remember Iraq, remember our staying in Lebanon. It's not that simple and we have experience, so it should be considered. Uh, uh, constraint number three is the very risk of developing into full uh, two, two uh, fronts. Uh, uh, clash. War, yeah. Yeah. Israel has no interest in it. I would not recommend it to the Hezbollah as well because they will have to pay a heavy price for it as well. But you cannot interpret their, their thought probably it's under some influence from the Iranians who want to torpedo the, the um, trilateral emerging deal between the oh, US, Soviet, and Israel. And so yeah. you cannot control it. It can de deteriorate without uh, either side wants it. It should be taken into account because it uh, influenced many aspects of the military deployment and what forces and how to do and how to uh, synchronize it. And the last one is the uh, element of time. We are aware of the fact that even if now you might hear a senior Israeli telling, we have all the time in the world, we, we the, uh, the whole world is behind us. We know from, I know from firsthand experience, it declines. People see the collateral damage at the Gaza Strip and the, the elderly women running after the, the pieces of, of uh, their grandson or so. It uh, declines along the way. And Israel should, should keep the moral high ground, should uh, keep the, the rules of the international laws. Uh, Biden, uh, President Biden mentioned it in in both of his appearances, and I'm sure that Blinken raised it with almost anyone that he uh, met here. Uh, basically, uh, Israel is expected to behave differently from these Al Qaeda or ISIS like uh, a terror organization, and this is a constraint. So, to when I'm asked, so what will be? I, I can't tell you the uh, exact because it's it data and details uh, based decision that develop along the way. But uh, with uh, uh, Eisenkot and Gantz in the inner cabinet at Gallant, I am uh, quite confident that all these elements will be uh, you know, taken uh, very uh, responsibly into consideration. Do you worry that um, the international legitimacy that Israel has now um, in view of what's happened, although the blockade and the airstrikes, which have claimed many, many, many Palestinian lives, do you worry that that international legitimacy is going to erode? And how do you? Yeah, I just, I just men mentioned it as the last uh, constraint. We have to take into account. I don't believe that many, uh, many, many were dying as a result of this blockade. The blockade is uh, probably at most three years, uh, three days old. Uh, that's not uh, doesn't yet create a humanitarian uh, crisis. But I'm confident, without having any information, Israel will not let uh, people dying in hospital because there was a shortage of uh, of uh, medications or some other equipment, and, and a convoy with with uh, all this equipment is. is uh, standing or waiting in uh, in uh, in the entrance from Rafa from Egypt, and we block it. I don't believe in it, and so it's a element yeah. of uh, pressure right now. You could expect Israel to follow the uh, international rules. I am confident that uh, sooner or later some corridor for for humanitarian aid and so might be open. And uh, some people raised the idea that uh, Gaza should uh, flee into the Egyptian side of Rafa. There is Rafa, right. Rafa Gaza Strip and Rafa Egypt or, or into Sinai. We are in no position to recommend it to, to the Egyptian um, government. It's up to them. Uh, but if some, some, uh, uh, some fraction of the Gaza population will, will go uh, temporarily into the... the 
Egyptian side of Rafa, I don't think that it's a great, uh, great uh, problem or might make a great problem. Right. Until now about 400,000 people, which is about 20% of, uh, of the Gaza population, left their uh, normal residential place and concentrated in other places. Because we, we announce clearly that everyone who lives in a building where there is any operation, a physical operation, holding some rockets or ammunition, or even office operations and coordination, or, or, or Hamas people living there should leave their uh, places because these are targets. Every place where there is any imprint of uh, the Hamas is a legitimate target in terms of the, the international law, but for sure in, in our terms of the objective to be accomplished. How, let me ask you a question. In 2006, the Omer government um, had two objectives, which they made public. One was to return the two Israeli soldiers. The other was to eradicate Hezbollah's presence in South Lebanon. Do you think the government will clearly articulate to the Israeli public the purposes of the operation? And will there be a series of metrics by which the pu Israeli public, forget anybody else now, will be able to judge the success or lack of success of this operation? How much clarity will there be, do you think, I think that the uh, absence of clarity as of now is just the result of the uh, simultaneous dealing with how to run the, the real operations now and how to establish this um, emergency cabinet. And uh, in between, everyone uses uh, slogans from his imagination. Uh, it, will, it won't take more than a few days where a formal uh, 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 definition will emerge, which be, I, be, I, I think in, in this or that, a small, small uh, language uh, difference is basically what I, I have said to uh, uh, paralyze any physical possibility of uh, Hamas to act as terror organization. We cannot control or pretend to control their wishes, their dreams, their ideology or whatever, or the spirit of the Hamas, the soul of Hamas hovering uh, in the air. But we can uh, put an uh, objective of clearing the, the Gaza Strip for any uh, uh, launcher, any rocket, any lab, any uh, uh, weapon, any office, any training center, any and, and physical, e even the leaders uh, of Hamas are, became uh, explicitly targeted for our uh, attacks. So, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't say that once you made it clear, the definition, it will become easier to achieve it, but at right. least it might make it clear to the public what you want. Right. But you mentioned a, a war where uh, uh, listeners or viewers might think that is a really uh, organized war where the, the objective were put. It was the worst war for this, uh, uh, this uh, aspect. Uh, the government didn't plan a war didn't want a war, didn't know that it enters a war. They saw that they're just responding for a small tactical event of a, a hijacking a few right. soldiers and, and a killing few soldiers. And it uh, uh, reservists were not mobilized. Uh, the very state of emergency in the, in the economy, had not been, even a war was not declared. The government found itself totally confused in a war. And that was one of the reasons for the disaster. My critic of this war that was that even if something dramatic happens and you are confident you have to do something about it, that that case uh, is also the case here, you have better to think for a while, to stop, to, to drink uh, cold water, to gather the best uh, brains, to take another 10 hours, another 12 hours, another 24 hours or two days and make sure you understand what you want to achieve and how you plan to achieve it. Yeah. You cannot leave everything to, to kind of improve the improvisation along the way. Yeah. So just to summarize, the, um, in your view, the objective of the operation is to eradicate 
Hamas's military presence and capability and capacity in Gaza, including, uh, if it's feasible, an elimination of the leadership there. Yeah, um, and, and elimination the control of the Gaza Strip by this. If we take the whole the whole uh, uh, Gaza Strip, including the city, it doesn't make sense to give it back uh, to Hamas because they, you don't kill all the individuals who carry the Hamas ideology or believe or dream about it. Right. So it might be rebuilt. So we need another order there. It's not exactly. another world order. It's not even a, a, a new regional. It's a new order within the Gaza Strip with the more natural address being the Palestinian Authority. Right. So unlike 2008, 2011, 2014, 2021, when the objective or the result was to undermine Hamas's military capacity, but but not dislodge it as a governing authority, this objective would do both of those two things. Yeah. So you need do, it, do the first yeah. one uh, right fully. So you need a day after. Your problem is the day after, correct? No, my problem is all the constraints. We have very right. uh, subtle constraints that I don't want to dive into with the hostages. Right. We have a very sensitive constraint in how to shape. Probably now it will emerge. I don't know. Uh, 15 years ago, I couldn't achieve it. Probably now it's a different place. Probably the, uh, some of these players, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, decided they will take uh, take it for six months and bring back the Palestinian Authority. It was a great, uh, great uh, uh, blessing. Right. Uh, the third element is the risk of uh, stretching it to a uh, two front, bigger. Uh, you have to bear in mind the Hezbollah have, have 10 times uh, more rockets and missiles and can yeah. try to saturate our whole defense uh, system. And uh, and they have uh, even several hundreds of accurate missiles with a CEP of probably 30 meters, 20 meters, which might become a risk for, for a sensitive target within the country, strategic target. So, and the last one is the, the erosion of the legitimacy. All right. these elements had to be taken into account simultaneously. And out of it, we still have to, to create a concrete orders for the fighting forces about how do you start to achieve the targets and what are, what's the nature of the tree of, uh, of development that, that uh, we take into account. Well, uh, we're running out of time and I wanted to ask you, uh, you have a very sober view of Iran, but I wanted, yeah. I wanted to ask you, um, in your view, and we're really running out of time, uh, how involved do you think? I know you're, you're not reading the intelligence, none of us know. How involved do you think Iran was in specific? Iran is a source of inspiration. Iran is a source of, of inspiration to these all these uh, uh, resistance to Israel, uh, both Hezbollah very intimately with Hamas a little bit less intimately. I, for example, do not believe in the story that was published about a week ago in the in the Wall Street Wall Journal. Street I Journal. believe that Iranians say. Uh, in some gathering in Beirut, gave the final permission to operate. I don't believe that the Hamas uh, get the the uh, permission of uh, Iran, uh, even if just out of uh, of the fear that it will leak to to Israeli intelligence or to your intelligence. That would be my. I don't. I don't think they need it. Uh, but in a way, the the sending of the Gerald Ford to the uh, Eastern Mediterranean is a signal, both to Hezbollah to the Lebanese government, but also in a more indirect way to Iran. We are behind Israel, don't be tempted to do to do something. Right. I think that the Iranians are interested in uh, having uh, friction with Israel, uh, but they have other interests as well, the six billion, the, 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 the dialogue kind of uh, direct or less direct about uh, their status as a um, nuclear threshold state and so on. Iran is now in good mood. They produce a daily of uh, daily some 2.4 2 million barrels. Uh, they are not under pressure. They are, became supplier of weapons to Russia out of all places. They enjoy much better close relations with China. 
they feel, uh, feel much better. They took over the unrest from within and they uh, feel that they interpret the crisis in Israel, the internal crisis that we were dealing with so intensely until uh, a week ago, uh, as a point of uh, kind of kind of opportunity, but not necessarily to to attack directly or to drag it to the ex- right. uh, uh, to, to the end of of their option, because they also know that Israel is a is a country or nation that unites under threats, under external threat. You know all these pilots that we talked about that uh, suspended their voluntary behavior. It, uh, I, I told all along the way, don't worry, if there is a war, they will come, they will be the first to come and to risk their life in order to save the country. Yes. Uh, but they, they want to, to, to Israel to remain a democracy, and that's another story. We won't uh, be able to cover it within the next 30 seconds. Right. We'll do it at, at some other point. Mr. Prime Minister, I want to thank you so much for your honesty, clarity, and your wisdom. Um, and I wish you all the best. Um, in the days ahead, I, I worry about the loss of innocent life uh, among Israelis and Palestinians greatly. Um, and who knows? Crises sometimes can generate opportunities. Yeah, but in a delay, in a delay, not yes. simultaneously. Uh, it, it'll take a while. Be- better days to come. Yes. We will win, but what comes after it's still, uh, yeah. it's still the jury is still out. Uh, thank thank you again. And, um, talk to you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron, and thank all the viewers who uh, For sure, spent their time watching us. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.